I didn't see anything. Um, let's see. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Kim Hicks. Um, I'm joining you from the Office of Data and Innovation for the state of California, and I'm going to be talking to you about a new service we have um, in CalData. Um, I used to work um, at the City College, and so it's kind of fun to be back here. Um, these are my kids that are in this picture. Um, I now work for the state of California, and we have a new service. Um, and that new service is very data science-y, and so I'm excited to tell you about that service today. It's called the Data Science Accelerator. Um, it's a service that different departments across the state can apply for, and if they're selected, then we form partnerships with them, and we solve their business problems using data science. Um, what I'm going to be walking you all through are real examples of um, data science being used Actually, all of the examples we're going to look at are examples that were used for um, data science for the city of, of San Francisco. I also used to be a data scientist for the city of San Francisco. Okay, so it's called the Data Science Accelerator. That's the name of this new state service. So what is it? Um, so the idea is that a department or team would use the Data Science Accelerator when they have a business problem that requires advanced statistical modeling. Oftentimes, they're just suspicious that maybe they need advanced statistics, right? So um, what then what would happen is they'd apply, you know, we kind of sort through whether or not we thought it was a data science problem, if it was, um, and we thought that it had high impact and it was a project we wanted to take on, then what would happen is we'd apply different data science techniques to the existing data that generates new insights. And then those insights lead to a service change or an improvement in a business process. Um, so the ultimate goal here is smarter and more efficient work. So that's very high level what the data science accelerator is about. So to give you a clearer picture of what the data science accelerator is capable of, I'm going to walk you through several examples, um, as I mentioned, from the city of San Francisco. And to help us with the framing of various types of data science problems in the government space, I'm actually going to walk you through these five topologies. We developed them to help folks understand what type of business problem might be ripe for advanced statistics. Um, so we have find the needle in the haystack, prioritize your backlog, flag stuff early, optimize your resources, and A-B test something. Um, it's worth noting that these five topologies were created to address common data science problems um, we find in the public sector. So we're going to be going through each of these. And we're going to start with find the needle in the haystack. So here you need to, with the find the needle in the haystack, the idea is you need to target something or someone that's a rare occurrence. And it's important to identify that rare occurrence. Um, here, we'd use predictive modeling to identify the combination of factors that led to the rare occurrence. In this case, the service change would be to engage with those the predictive model flagged as most likely to be the target we're interested in. So as a specific example of the find the needle in the haystack, um, this is an example that comes from San Francisco. Um, back in 2015, there were more than 20 families that were being evicted from a single building. It was two Emory Lane. Um, fortunately, the tenants were in contact with each other and they were able to organize with each other. And their protests did reach the ear of the mayor. And the mayor stepped in and was able to convince the landlord to remove most of the eviction notices. Um, that was great, but it wasn't sustainable and it wasn't a scalable strategy. And it left the mayor's deputy chief of staff wondering, are there other two Emory lanes? Um, so he came to us with the question, can we identify problematic evictions as they are happening? So before people are actually evicted. So in terms of analytics, we needed to find a way to flag evictions outside the norm. Um, when we analyzed the historic eviction data and combined it with property owner data, we found two distinct patterns over time. So the first was around buildings. So we were able to create a way to flag buildings that evict an unusually high percentage of their units 
in a short period of time. So these are essentially more of those two Emory lanes. Um, we flagged these as potential mass eviction events. Um, so the target flagged in this case was individual buildings. And then the second type of event looked through the lens of the landlord um, rather than the building. So here the focus is on the landlords who own multiple properties. So the pattern now we're trying to detect was if there were owners who repeatedly evict tenants across properties. So here the targets flagged were the individual landlords. Okay, so we identified these two patterns um, and we flagged the targets. Now we can actually have a service change. So we could we set up a system to kind of respond to those flags. So um, first, what happens is the eviction notice is filed. We then combine the data with historical property and owner information. So we detect the trends used in the predictive modeling piece. Um, the algorithm runs and it flags the potential evictions or repeat evictions. Um, then the flagged owners and the properties, um, there's actually a list and it's sent to a team. And that team now, um, they're subject matter experts. So they use their knowledge um, around the flags to decide kind of like whether or not a tenant, um, they need tenant or landlord outreach. Um, so the city ultimately was able to enhance its current eviction prevention services by adding proactive outreach to what had traditionally just been a service based on self-referral. So it used to just rely on folks kind of complaining, um, and this is a way for the city to try to get ahead of that. And having the ability to reach people while they're still housed is critical to preventing tremendous upheaval in people's lives, obviously, in terms of money, time, and countless quality of life issues. Okay, so let's look at the second topology type. This is um, the prioritize your backlog. So in this case, think about needing to provide a service to a list of people or places, and the way the list is currently being tackled is first in, first out. So here, a data science technique could be applied where we establish patterns around which items in the list require more immediate attention. So the service change is that now we now have a way to prioritize the list to kind of mitigate risk or address like the bigger needs or the bigger opportunities. So now um, for a specific example, um, also from the city of San Francisco. So the question in this case was how to better process a giant backlog of property sales. So the main concept here is that cities need to assess every property that sells and decide whether it was sold at fair market value. And the reason they need to do this is because property tax is, is calculated according to what the sale price was. Um, the most recent sale on that property. So the city needs to feel good that the sale price is similar to the fair market value. Um, but on um, the assessors, they need to consider a wide range of property characteristics for every one of these sales. So they're thinking about square footage and bedrooms and bathrooms and when it was sold and where it was sold. And there's so many things they have to think about. Um, so you can see how this can be overwhelming to the assessors and it easily leads to a giant backlog. Okay, so they have this huge backlog of properties and it, they need to be assessed. So how are they going to prioritize these assessments? So this is where we come in. So we analyze the detailed property and sales data. Our solution ultimately was to develop a suite of prediction models based on property type. So one for condos, one for multifamily, one for single family. And each of these models use the different property characteristics that I was going over earlier um, to calculate a predicted price sold for each property. So now comes the service change. So with our prediction for each property, we were able to identify kind of this range of reasonable values for each sale. Um, all the sales that were within this reasonable range, those were accepted as fair market value and automatically assessed at the new tax amount. But if the sale price was lower or higher than what was deemed reasonable by the model, um, those sales, those were prioritized for a full appraisal. So now the assessor is able to do a thorough appraisal on the property sales that have been flagged as unusual. So they can now apply their expertise to giving a fair and full analysis on the truly unusual property sales. 
and the results. Um, so in our very first model run, the backlog was reduced by 10%. That means it took $239 million that was on the roll and turned that into $2.8 million in tax revenue. And then the model was continually improved upon and ultimately the historic backlog was eliminated. So this model has been in continuous use since 2017 and there's no more backlog. And then the third topology um, we'll look at is called flag stuff early. So this is when you suspect you could like anticipate an event before it happens using data. So in this case, we're trying to detect conditions that lead to a reactive service. Um, so we know we could be doing a better job in terms of preventing these situations. So here, a data science technique could be applied um, so we identify various points in the process where people are more likely to divert themselves from the negative outcome. And the service change um, is that we can now intervene at various points in the process that are kind of tailored to get people back on track. Um, so for example, um, from the city of San Francisco, um, we'll use uh, an example from our WIC program. So WIC, WIC, that stands for Women, Infants, and Children. It's a nutrition program for low-income families. And what we were seeing is that retention rates were falling over time. So we saw fewer and fewer families were sticking through the program to get their babies to their first year. And by the time those kids reached age five, only 28% of the families had kept with the program to reach the maximum benefit. Um, and so the team, the WIC team didn't know if maybe it was economic conditions or maybe it was a change in the population or was it something else. So we stepped in and we built a tree model in this case, and um, it helped identify predictors of how people were dropping out. So the tree model was helpful because it splits your population hierarchically, meaning like variables that are higher in the tree contribute more um, to predicting retention. Um, and this type of modeling helps you to kind of isolate unique combinations in your population that are at high risk. So in this case, we found that being an English speaker with little prenatal engagement was a subpopulation associated with the lowest retention rates. And feeding choice among that subpopulation was another strong predictor. Um, after reviewing these results with the WIC team and looking at the subpopulations with the like the biggest, starkest differences in retention, they found it helpful to consider what different subpopulations might need at various points in the process. So now that we kind of identified those subpopulations at highest risk of dropping out, um, now it was important to understand why the segments of the population weren't sticking with the program. So often with predictive analytics, you can identify what and when something is going to happen and maybe who it's going to happen to, but you still don't really understand why. So we knew we'd need a qualitative approach to get to the why these groups weren't being retained. And so we partnered with a third party to conduct participant interviews to unpack why the folks weren't retaining their benefits. Um, and that led to a variety of changes, including an anti-stigma campaign, campaign um, more modern tech outreach, and then a future outreach strategy around doctors with doctors. Okay, so um, now the fourth tep topology type. Um, this one's called Optimize Your Resources. So this one, um, now the need... Um, is like to best leverage assets, resources, and focus to meet the needs of the organization. So um, here you apply statistical modeling to find levers to pull and push in the organization that lead to maximize, lead to like optimal output um, or maximize your output. Um, or it could be about identifying bottlenecks um, that are preventing growth from happening. Um, in this case, the service changes to reallocate the organization's resources to focus focus on like the pain points um, and the influential levers. And so here, another example from San Francisco. Um, in this case, the question was, who are the best new customers for a lighting incentive program? So the city has a program to incentivize swapping old bulbs for more efficient lighting. 
Um, but the uptake in their program had dropped off in recent years. Both their number of projects and their energy savings had decreased. Um, so they came to us because they weren't sure if they'd exhausted their list of potential customers or if there were new ways to identify new customers and new leads. And so the first thing we discovered was that their list of leads was based on really limited information. So the first thing we did was create a new list of buildings that was enriched with multiple data sources that they weren't using. Um, once we had that new enriched data set, we then did analysis to identify predictors of businesses or buildings that were more likely to complete projects. Um, and we were able to, um, excuse me, oops, sorry, we were able to increase their leads for the commercial properties by 250% and their multifamily um, leads by 1000%. Okay, so then we had this new list um, where we prioritized the leads by placing the most attractive leads at the top and the properties were deemed more attractive based on their likelihood to need upgrades and their potential for energy savings. Okay, so now we're to the last topology um, and that's A-B test something. So this is about running experiments, usually in a digital environment, but not always. So in the case of A-B testing, you may find yourself wondering if you could be more effective if you change the design of your content materials. That could be a digital design. It could be a form, a questionnaire, even a text message. Um, so here we could design an experiment to isolate the impact of making an important change. So it could help to identify which format um, to do, uh, like the best format to use or when to send it or even who to send it to. And in this case, the service change is to apply the best method identified in the experiment, and then you absorb the increase in engagement or conversion. So here's, um, this is just a simple example that was done in the city. So in this example, the treasurers and tax collection department felt they could have higher compliance um, with a new collections letter. So by designing and performing a test of these two different designs, we were able to test which letter was better. Um, so the new letter did lead to a 17% increase in response. Um, and, you know, A-B testing can be applied to more than just letters. Um, it extends to often digital experimentation. Um, it helps um, organizations improve like KPIs on their website um, and just kind of outreach methods in general. But that brings me to the end of my different examples. I want to thank you for being great listeners. Um, also, I just wanted to um, throw out some additional resources. So maybe you're still not sure what data work looks like in the government, or you just would like to learn more. Um, we do have many resources for you. So we, we have a newsletter that we send out um, at least monthly, sometimes bi-monthly. Um, we also have other data services that we are offering that are new. So I just went over the data science accelerator as a new service, but we also have an analytics accelerator and a modern data stack accelerator. This is all happening in Cal data in the office of data and innovation. Um, and then there's also a microsite that highlights just in general, California state data jobs that might also be interesting to you. And then I also wanted to let folks know that we will be hiring interns. Um, so CalData, the team that I work on, will be hiring for summer internships, and those postings will be coming soon. In terms of specifically for um, data science internships, we're going to be doing part-time data science internships that will likely begin in the fall. But those are going to be things that, um, those are going to be kind of part-time around the calendar year positions that will be opening up. Um, and then we have a number of full-time positions available as well. So that is all I have for you. And I'd love to hear if anybody has any questions or comments. Sean, you're muted. Thanks, Kim. Uh, so yeah, post your questions in the chat uh, and then Kim can look through there to uh, pick and choose your favorite, what you have time for. Um, but yeah, Kim, we, we give you a oh, little- Oh, there's the chat. Virtual... My chat was on a different monitor, so I'm sorry. Uh, give you a little virtual clap. Thank you so much for sharing. Oh, sure. Let's see. What kind of questions do I have here? 
Um, do government use Power BI at every level or just specialized person? So it's funny you bring up Power BI because um, on this slide, um, when I was talking about the different data services that we offer, that analytics accelerator is really built around Power BI. So it's kind of all about the analytics accelerator is all about getting folks to kind of um, stop doing manual reporting and automate their reporting and then ultimately putting the most important things into a dashboard. And the tool of choice for the analytics accelerator is Power BI, mostly because we have a giant contract with Microsoft, um, but also because it's useful. Um, let's see. Can you talk about how you will measure the success of the data science accelerator program? That is a very good question. So let me tell you a little bit about the process. So the first thing that we do is we have what's called a solicitation phase where I'm basically going around um, to different departments and I'm giving them a, a talk very like similar to the talk I just gave you to get folks kind of interested in it. Um, often they still have questions and they're not sure if they're a good fit. So then what happens is we hold a series of office hours over the course of several weeks where people can drop in and they kind of tell us specifically about their problem. And we kind of try to work out what those details are. When that happens, a big question is like, how are we going to measure success? Um, so we have to get an idea of what the impact is. And then a lot of times, like the impact, it, you know, sometimes it's fiscal and then it's kind of easy. Like the one I was talking about with the property sales, when you actually have like a dollar amount attached to it, it's a little bit easier to measure success. Sometimes it's a little bit trickier. Like, um, if it's, you know, something like, uh, maybe like with the WIC program, um, like we identified these kind of different subpopulations that were more at high risk. Then we have like this next step where like a third party comes in and kind of tries to help identify the reasons why then we need to respond to them. So then sometimes you're talking about like years down the road, we're actually able to kind of like measure like whether or not that improved retention. Um, so for every single project, you kind of have to think differently about what your impact metrics are going to be, but it's definitely an important part of the process um, and something that we take very seriously. Um, will you apply any of the topologies to the program itself? So the topologies, like, it's funny because the topologies confuse me a little bit because I think my background is in statistics. And so I want to like, what I want to do when I see the topologies is I want like a different approach to align with each of the different topologies, but that's not the purpose of the topologies. The purpose of the topologies is to get people who aren't used to thinking about statistics to think about common problems that they have, knowing that statistics potentially could help them solve that problem. Um, so I always kind of like have to do some like gymnastics in my head to like be like, actually like any, you could like use like all sorts of different approaches for each of these topologies or like one approach for all of them. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's kind of how I think about it. I get confused by the topologies, even though they're supposed to like bring clarity to people. Um, what kind of tech skills are departments like yours looking for? Um, you know, so, you know, being able to write in a scripting language is really important. So, um, you know, Python, R, the, like, in order to do kind of statistical analysis is important, but just querying in general is important. So having some SQL skills is important. Um, it's not super important to be like comfortable with like being able to like query in the cloud, like cloud computing platforms, but um that's something that you can kind of get trained up in if you're just used to regular SQL. A lot of those platforms, they have like a similar querying space. Um, so if you know SQL, you'll be okay. So I guess I'd say that like um, a scripting language, like um, Python, Python's probably the most important or, and or R and, um, and SQL would be the most important things. Um, and then like in terms of like the modern data stack, like they're using things like Fivetran and DBT and um, Snowflake. Um, those are kind of like the big 
um, in like the engineering, um, like there's an engineering team that has the modern data stack accelerator. And those are the tools that they are kind of getting folks um, when they're modernizing their infrastructure of different departments, that's what they're using. Um, I guess I just talked about the tech stacks. Thank you for your presentation. You have talked about five, are there other topologies as well? Yes, I imagine there are. Um, the one that like, I always think we should probably add is forecasting. Like forecasting is um, something that I think everybody can relate to, or most departments, they need a forecast for something. It helps them with planning. And that's very easy to see how like statistics could help you with your forecasting. Um, how can data scientists fight bias? So this is a, actually, we had this new um, ethics toolkit that we're going to be using on this cohort, something that we didn't do for our projects in San Francisco. Ultimately, what it is, is like when we first accept a project, we're going to have to like put the project through this ethics toolkit where we need to like answer questions and like write down like the different variables we're measuring and the different um, communities that will be impacted. And like, we have to like talk through like how like the modeling ultimately could end up like perpetuating inequities and things like that. It's very new. And so like I, um, we're kind of like building it as we go. We kind of just have like a general framework and we're hoping like after the first couple that we'll be able to like make it more of a streamlined process, but it's probably going to take tailoring for every single project, but that's a really good question and something that we're thinking about. Um, yeah, so that's like the ethics one. Um, we try not to skew data to favor political opinions, <laughs> but that's the thing. People bring bias. So you can't trust, you know, people who make the models, they have their own bias. So it's a good point. Um, let's see. Solving public health issues, using data science tools such as the opioid e epidemic. I have not ever worked on a project personally about the opioid epidemic. I know that there's a lot of work in other jurisdictions where they look a lot at this. I haven't. Um, let's see. How is the data collection guaranteed to be correct? Well, there is no guarantee. I'll tell you that much. And um, a lot of the data that was collected for that light bulb project was like publicly available data um, on open data for San Francisco. And a lot of that data has errors in it. It's kind of like you just kind of have to accept that it, there's, it's going to be imperfect. I don't know. It just goes with the territory. Um, let's see. We're at 4.30. How does everybody feel, Sean? I'm, I'm happy to keep posting. Is you, you can answer as many as you want to. Um, oh, okay. We are at time, so it's, I'll be here for a few minutes, and you, you decide how much you want to do. Okay. Anybody want to say like, or uh, no, I can just keep answering questions. Let me just get through some of these. These are, these are good questions. Um, how is it explaining your findings in order to help convince certain bodies to continue funding certain problems? So actually like we try to stay away from like trying to convince people to work with us, honestly. So that's why we have the process set up that like, we try to get you excited. We want you to apply. And then kind of one of the criteria is that like, you need to be an engaged partner that wants to work with us. It's, we have like, uh, I have experience like, trying to like get people to do something when I'm out on my own, trying to build something and like make them look at it. And that doesn't seem to work very well. It's like, you need everybody to like want to do something. Cause then even if you find something, then you need them to act on it. And if they aren't like motivated to do that, it's just, it hasn't really worked in my experience. Um, Yes, it is end-to-end -end data work, I would say, um, because we work so closely like with data engineering um, to kind of like get people set up with like the right infrastructure. And then like we come in when like at the beginning of the project and we really do work from like the very beginnings of the project all the way through implementation. Um, that's true. How has data science evolved since your early career? So my first job out of grad school was I worked for Domino's Pizza in Michigan. Their world headquarters is in Dom is in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And um, I remember getting that job and they were like really excited because they had this 
big data, which was 60,000 rows of data, which is not big data according to today's standards. And so um, they were excited because they'd be able to like, they were excited that we could like run a model on this data that was refreshed every night. And it was like the first time they tried to like run a model on this big data. And anyway, so it's changed in that people like, um, that was like kind of cutting edge thinking back then. And that's now like, that's just how generally people think about things. Actually, people think about things like they want models to run in real time. That's something that we don't really do. Um, we like, if we automate something, it's generally like we're waiting on data to kind of load maybe like overnight. And then we'd run a model against that. Um, different tech jobs, especially around San Francisco, you'd be getting more into like trying to do real time, like um, have a model run in real time. Um, so that's how in that big way how things have changed. Um, how do the government implement all the tools and analytics? They don't. So there's like a huge need for a lot more of this work um, in government. So like, you know, we had we had dozens and dozens of applications like for this first cohort and we were able to take three projects this cohort. So like there's like a huge need for more of this work and we're just able to kind of just start to. So yeah, they're, hopefully like we'll bring so much value that we'll be able to hire more people <laughs> to like bring, bring, come on and help us solve more problems. Um, how do you determine which data sets to use? So we basically rely on our clients, like these different departments to tell us what data we should be using to solve their problems. Um, one of the um, necessary pieces is that they need to have their data ready to go in order for us to start working. So we aren't gonna like take on a project if they're not sure like what their data is. Um, sometimes we have ideas, like because we know that there's open data sets that are available that would be useful, like I guess with that lighting project. Um, but for the most part, like they need to come with the data in hand. Um, how many people are in on the analytical team? So like in all of ODI, there's probably like 50 of us, but just in Cal Data, um, there's probably like 20 of us, I think. Um, so like there's like 20 of us that are like really working on like data stuff and analytics. Um, who we'll qualify for Schedule A? Um, yeah, I don't know the specific details, but if you reach out to like Cal Data HR, they are really helpful in like helping folks figure out um the ways around things, like if, if there's like a, a different process that you might need. Um, let's see. I was wondering if you have any experience with solving public health issues. Um, oh yeah, that was the opioid one. Nope, sorry. Um, do you usually need to create your own special model? Yes. So like every single project is very different and we spend a ton of time just talking with clients about their specific data need. So like early on in my career, like when people didn't really know what they were doing, they just like, they'd be like, oh, let's get like a statistician in here. And then they just like give them data and then they go off for months and then they come back with like what they thought the solution was. And that like, it was, it's like always a disaster, it, like never meets your, the, the client's needs. And so um, every single time, like if you don't work really closely with ultimately like the stakeholders, like you end up in a bad, bad place. And um, it's really easy as like a statistician to just get carried away with making the best model, what you think is the best model. A lot of times it's not useful. So um, yeah, every model is very unique. What is the most rewarding project you've worked on? Um, so like there's these like quick and easy ones that are really, they feel really good. Um, but then there's ones that are harder, um, that are more rewarding, but like, so like one, when I was at San Francisco, it was, um, high users of multiple systems across the city. So these are people that are like, um, using programs that have to do with substance abuse. Um, they're also in and out of the, the um, county jail. Um, they're also using homeless shelters. So they're high users of like these multiple systems and it's trying to identify like where that first like 
like entry point is, like where we could help them the most early on to like prevent them from like, um, I guess, like um, relying on all of the services and like, you know, it's, it's always more helpful to help people earlier in the process. I was starting to work on that. I probably did like a year's worth of work with a group of folks in San Francisco on that. And it's really just kind of starting to scratch the surface. It like requires like a lot of deep, deep analysis and working really closely with people who work with, with folks in those situations. Um, in terms of undocumented students, you know, I really think that um, asking CalHR, would they be like really helpful about this? Um, I would imagine that the answer is yes, um, but you'd have to ask CalHR about that. What is the not-for-profit, nonpartisan civic initiative making government data easy for all Americans to access? I don't know what that is. Um, I'm not sure what, I don't, I don't think I know even what USA Facts is, sadly. Um, is anything else from folks? Okay, well, I want to thank you for your attention and your questions. Um, I hope you all have a beautiful weekend. And it's nice to see you, Katya. Hey, thanks, Kim. There, uh, there was one question I thought was kind of, in, I don't know, if, I didn't hear you address it, but oh, it was I might have added, something. Yeah, it was, it was added last minute. But how do you stay up to date? Like this field changes so much, like so quickly. Like, what do you use to stay up on things? Well, I don't know. I try to talk to people. I think you just kind of feel that way. So there's a lot of like imposter syndrome in this space. And like, I think everybody kind of feels like they're not like keeping up and they don't know the latest thing. Um, after you've worked in the field a while, I think you get more comfortable like being open about not knowing things. And that gets you a long way because then that like people like, when you're just like more open to like, um, knowing that you don't know and people know that they share things with you you look at it you ask questions um i think that that gets you a lot further than like or like maybe earlier on when you're feeling more self-conscious like not asking and like not sure where to like direct your eyes a lot of times though like it's project dependent like certain mm -hmm. things come up with certain projects and you end up going down those rabbit holes cool. all right well thank you so much kim thanks everyone for being here and i'll let you all know about the next one as well I'll, follow, I'll email you all as well with the slides in case you want some of that information and, and Kim's contact in case you want to talk to her further. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. That was awesome, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Bye. Bye. Take care.